This is Duke University. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Erin Worsham. I'm the executive director of CASE, the Center for the Advancement of Social Entrepreneurship here at the Fuqua School of Business. I wanted to start off the afternoon by welcoming everyone to Fuqua and saying a few thanks. First of all, thank you to all of you for being here, for braving the, the threat of storms. We haven't quite seen the, the snow come yet, but there, there has been quite a, quite a buzz about the upcoming storm. So thank you for braving that and being here with us this afternoon. And there are many people that wish they could have been here and were planning on being here, but due to canceled flights and poor driving conditions, were not able to attend at the last moment. So we wanted to welcome those of you who couldn't be here with us in person, but are watching on the webcast, the live stream right now. And also, on behalf of Fuqua and the CASE team, a special thank you to the Duke Innovation and Entrepreneurship Initiative for their partnership in planning tonight's events, and also to Beth Anderson for being our rock throughout this all. I wanted to take a, a few minutes before we get started with, with this afternoon's program to give an overview of the sequence of events for tonight. We'll be here at Fuqua until 6 p.m. and then we'll head over to the Divinity School for a reception and a memorial service at the Goodson Chapel. There will be shuttle buses that will shuttle from here at Fuqua after this portion of the event is over to the Divinity School and will loop continuously um, throughout the evening. So we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of the night and I'll remind you about those shuttle buses. The events tonight are an opportunity for all of us to come together as a community to mourn Greg's passing and to remember the absolutely amazing man whom we all loved. We'll have a few of Greg's close friends speak at the memorial service to share their personal reflections on his life. But as we were planning these events for this afternoon and evening, we realized that what Greg would have wanted was not just a time to mourn, and he wouldn't have wanted the focus to be on him as an individual. One of his wonderful traits was that despite his success, he remained incredibly humble and was always diverting praise and credit to the others around him. So what he would have wanted was for us to get together and celebrate how far the field of social entrepreneurship has come, to talk about the impact of his life's work and the work that is still left to be done. So we hope that this next hour and, and half or hour and 45 minutes here at Fuqua will be a chance for us to do just that. So in that vein, I just wanted to, to spend a few minutes talking about the three things that we hope to celebrate here at Fuqua this afternoon. First, Greg's role as a teacher and a mentor to so many. Second, his role in creating this field of social entrepreneurship. And finally, what Greg would have wanted us to do, to look forward and talk about what's next. First, regarding Greg's role as a teacher and mentor, there are many and many in this audience, students, alumni, practitioners, and academics all over the world who consider themselves to be one of Dee's mentees. We always had a lot of fun with that term at Case. We'd like to say it in front of Greg because he would immediately blush and be completely embarrassed that there was such a thing as Dee's mentees. As I said, he was very humble and didn't like the attention put on him. But it's true. The outpouring of, of memories and reflections that have been posted on the memorial website and emailed or, or called in to us at the case team has, has just been incredible. We've heard stories time after time of the impact that Greg's teaching and mentoring had on so many people's lives and careers. And I'm proud to call myself one of these mentees. I remember graduating from college with a degree in environmental policy a desire to change the world, and not a clue how to do it. I started my work in the nonprofit sector with a lot of energy and enthusiasm, but without the skills I really needed to have the impact that I was hoping to have. I started to hear about business schools which were focusing on, on young professionals like me who wanted to have a social impact in their careers. 
And as I was starting to learn about those, the one name that came up time and again was Greg Dees. So to the complete shock of myself, certainly my parents and everyone that knew me, I found, I found myself applying to business school and in my application talking about Greg Dees. I talked about wanting to take a class with him, wanting to understand more about this thing called social entrepreneurship, being fascinated that there was actually terminology and people like Greg that were out there articulating what it was that I was struggling to articulate for myself. Of course, once I made it to Stanford for business school, Greg left and came here to Duke. Uh, but I didn't give up. Years later, <laughs> I tracked him down. <laughs> I found my way back here to, to Duke and to Fuqua to work with Greg and the amazing Case team. From the moment I came to campus, I was nervous to meet this man, this legend of social entrepreneurship, and he welcomed me with open arms. On one of my first days, he gave me a four-leaf clover from his garden to wish me luck at Fuqua. Many of us have received those four-leaf clovers from Greg. He had a miraculous ability to find them wherever he went, and whenever I see one now, I think of him. And that was just the beginning of years of visits to our office, announcing himself when he arrived in our case suite with the very important question of M&Ms or Oreos, displaying the, the spoils that he had just purchased from the vending machine. And he would sit down for another impromptu conversation about social entrepreneurship, about life, about whatever was on his mind. He answered every question with patience and the wonderful explanations of an amazing teacher. His face was always lit with a smile and a twinkle in his eyes, which we have heard from many people who have shared their memories of him. That twinkle was well known. Greg made me feel important. He made me feel like I had true value to bring to this field. And he did that for so many people, including many of those in this room tonight. He was quite literally the beacon that I followed on my career path. And my story is, is not unique. So many of those stories of Greg uh, are involving people talking about the impact that he had on their lives and changing their path to one of greater meaning and impact. We'll have a chance to hear a few more of those stories tonight through a tribute that some of our wonderful alumni have pulled together, a tribute that shows the power of Greg's impact as a teacher and as a mentor. Second, we'll reflect on Greg's role in helping to create the field of social entrepreneurship. Greg was not only the co-founder of CASE, but also considered by many to be the father of social entrepreneurship education. We often called him the guru of social entrepreneurship. Again, he did not like it. He blushed every time, um, but, but he really was. When he began, social entrepreneurship was a term that not many had heard of or identified with. Now, a Google search reveals more than 65 million hits Nearly every business school or university has a center or program on social entrepreneurship. And social entrepreneurship is seen as a viable and credible career path for many bright young women, women and men. He was integral in making this happen. His piece, The Meaning of Social Entrepreneurship, is arguably one of the most widely distributed pieces in the field. Greg's impact was enormous, and through our speakers tonight, we will reflect on Greg's role in creating and building this field. And finally, we'll talk about moving forward. Greg was working on a book about what he termed the Open Solutions Society, a society that is adaptive, uses all of its talents and assets to solve social problems in creative ways, and provides the infrastructure to ensure that these solutions are scaled and effective. What we keep saying, and what we keep on hearing from many others, is that we had so much more to learn from Greg, and he had so much more to give. It's true, he did have so much more to give, but he has started the discussion for us, and it is up to us to carry the conversation forward, starting this afternoon and continuing throughout all of our careers and lives. So thank you again for being here to participate in this event and helping to honor Greg's spirit and his work. I'd like to call two of our amazing and wonderful alumni to the stage, Malin Moran and Beth Bafford, who will introduce the alumni tribute.
Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Mayland Moran. I am a Fuqua alum from 2013. Um, Greg's work influenced my entire career long before I ever came here. Um, and I also had the unbelievably fortunate opportunity to work with him in the latter part of 2013 on, um, on his book. Hi, everyone. I'm Beth Bafford, a Fuqua class of 2012. Um, I was in, his, in Greg, Greg's seminar my first year and was, I gave the great pleasure of being his teaching assistant my second year. Uh, he was a very close mentor and friend and has inspired me in, in every decision I've made beforehand, uh, miraculously, and, and since. So when we think back on Greg's life and his legacy, we think of him in so many roles. Um, he was a scholar, a thinker, a practitioner, and a friend to so many of us. Um, but throughout all of those, he was always a teacher and always a mentor. He couldn't really switch out of that. It was just part of who he was. Um, and this afternoon, uh, we wanted to honor that part of him um, with the help of Fuqua alumni um, from throughout his career here. So this, is, as Aaron mentioned, is just a small, this video that we're about to see is just a small snippet of the incredible army he has built uh, of change makers working around the world to alleviate poverty and to make our world a better place. Uh, so we, we intentionally put, put the titles and the, the organizations with which these folks are working so you can just see the breadth and depth of impact that Greg has inspired in all of us uh, around the globe. We want to take a moment to thank all of the alumni who um, submitted contributions to this piece. We're really grateful. And um, may we continue, continue to honor Greg in um, our careers and throughout the rest of our lives. Thanks. Thank you. When I think of Greg, I think of just a guy who lent legitimacy and identity to the, ac the academic field of social entrepreneurship and, um, and even just reflected upon my time sort of in Durham, uh, just making social entrepreneurship something that, that MBA students thought about, right? They think about how to sort of apply their skills and their passions in a really impactful way and, and something that will give meaning to, to, their, to their careers. And, and Greg, Greg made it that much easier for us that we're sort of evangelizing, you know, people pursue careers in the sector. He made it easier for us to, to say, hey, <laughs> there's some great examples of great people out there. Greg personally, or, or Fuqua for that matter, Greg's work, his writing, and his thought leadership in articulating and formulating the field of social entrepreneurship had a great impact on my life and my work in the nonprofit sector. If it weren't for Greg, I never would have come to Fuqua. Um, knowing what he was doing there with Case was an, was an immediate draw, and it's greatly benefited my life and my career as I continue to pursue impact investing. I'm eternally grateful to him and wish Greg eternal peace and his family great happiness. for a number of reasons. Um, but first and foremost, I actually didn't even really understand the concept of social entrepreneurship before. Um, a mentor actually gave me Greg D's book. Um, and I had been doing social entrepreneurship without even recognizing it at the American Heart Association. Um, so for me, it was I finally had a vocabulary. I finally had a way to really self-identify. And after that, I was just a voracious reader around anything related to social entrepreneurship. Um, and so it really cemented my desire to go back to school and get my MBA, to really get that toolkit and bring that toolkit back into the social sector.
What Greg taught me was how to be passionate for the cause of impact, but to do so in a manner that's gentle, kind, and humble. I'm carrying on those lessons as I work with a nonprofit here in Bogota, Colombia, where I'm working to support small and medium businesses with the objective of uh, growing local jobs and uh, strengthening the economy here in this emerging market. And once again, I do so with the lessons and inspiration that Greg left with me. Uh, it's a legacy that I think will live on for a very long time with me and uh, with many others. Greg, we miss you deeply. Well, it's hard to follow all of those wonderful faces. Um, I'm pleased to uh, bring um, an important um, and heartfelt message um, from the other coast. Um, one of our um, incredibly strong supporters and friends over the years has been Sally Osberg of the Skoll Foundation. Um, as many of you know, um, she's the president and CEO in Skoll, and she's been encouraging the global community of social entrepreneurs um, for a very long time. She's not only a high profile proponent of thought leadership and research and alliances um, to help social entrepreneurs address the world's most pressing problems, but she is a true friend uh, and colleague and uh, was a true friend and colleague of Greg's. So let's hear from her. Thanks so much, Kathy. I really wish I could have been with you all it's just an honor to be able to share some memories of the man we all love so much. In early 2001, when I began work as Jeff Skull's partner in building out the strategy for his foundation, neither he nor I had heard the term social entrepreneur. But as I dug into the endeavors that most attracted Jeff, the penny dropped. An entrepreneur himself, he was drawn to what he characterized as a special kind of leader someone who'd typically founded and was driving an alternative solution to a major social problem. Jeff had already met and was supporting Bill Strickland for one, impressed by Bill's success at preparing young people for productive careers, in contrast to the dismal performance of Pittsburgh's inner city schools. Armed with the idea of entrepreneurship for social benefit, with a particular example of Bill Strickland, I hit the jackpot when I came upon Greg Dees and his pioneering work on leaders of a particular bent, individuals every bit as innovative, driven, and focused as any Silicon Valley entrepreneur, individuals known as social entrepreneurs. It's hard to overestimate Greg's influence on the evolution of the Skull Foundation. From the eureka moment of realizing we were onto something important, affirmed by the body of work Greg had amassed during his years at Yale, Harvard, and Stanford, right through to the present day, we continue to draw upon his research and insights. 
Aiming to be good partners to the social entrepreneurs who make up our portfolio, we, like so many others, have been blessed by Greg's guidance. As I started on these remarks, I thought I'd simply list what I'd learned from Greg, but I quickly realized his insights were too complex for a laundry account of lessons learned. Instead, let me share some reflections on risk, resolve, and rigor, themes cutting across Greg's work. Like the social entrepreneurs who were to become his passion, Greg was a true risk taker. Those of you scholars in the room know the system is rigged in favor of established disciplines. Indeed, entrepreneurship itself has yet to take its place in the business school canon. And social entrepreneurship, well, how far could you really go? Pretty darn far, Greg proved. Moreover, Greg lit out on his own terms, hewing to an approach that met the Academy's standards for informed inquiry, but strove as well to be useful to practitioners. I draw comfort from knowing that in recent years, Greg, the faculty outlier, rose to such prominence that he was courted by just about every major university in the country. That he chose to stay at Duke and continue building his own venture, the Center for the Advancement of Social Entrepreneurship, speaks to the second attribute I believe Greg epitomized, resolve. Greg's commitment to social entrepreneurship spans two decades. His own body of work comprising more than 60 publications, dozens of courses, and countless citations should be evidence enough to refute those wanting to swat social entrepreneurship aside as simply another pesky fad or trend. But when we factor in all those he's influenced, academics, consultants, students, practitioners, philanthropists, policymakers, we take the true measure of his resolve. For Greg understood better than others trying to parse this phenomenon of social entrepreneurship, the meaning of impact for himself and for those he studied. By sticking with social entrepreneurship, even as others argued for alternative constructs, social innovation, social enterprise, social purpose, social business, Greg ensured the slow but steady buildup of a base of knowledge that is beginning to establish our field's bona fides. Fueling his resolve were important questions. How is social entrepreneurship related to entrepreneurship? Why should scale matter and what drives it? Can scaling deep be as significant as scaling broad? Can we correlate impact with an entity's for-profit or not-for-profit corporate status? And more recently, what are the conditions that enable social entrepreneurship? How can we as society strengthen them? And why should we care? To those questions and so many others, he brought the academician's rigor, insisting that evidence be marshaled and analysis applied. It's because of Greg's analyses that we understand the roles of levers like Medicare reimbursement, which was crucial to scaling hospice in the US. That earned revenue is no determinant of social entrepreneurship, but in fact, the dominant source of capital for most nonprofits. That conceiving of social entrepreneurship as the antidote to business entrepreneurship is not just woolly-headed, but dangerous, and so much more. In preparing to share these thoughts, I read through much of my correspondence with Greg, emails spanning more than a decade, along with articles, chapters, and the manuscript he'd been working on these past few years. And as I read, I found myself wanting to talk to Greg, to query him, add another example to an argument, talk a problem through. I wanted him to join my team and me around the table as we debated whether this or another social entrepreneur really had a shot at scaling her impact. I wanted to explore what he called his soft spot for mainstream business when it is conducted honorably and why we should care about high quality, affordable plastic swimming pools. Those of you who've had the privilege of reading Greg's manuscript for his book on the Innovative Society may remember this section. Greg recalls reading a news story expressing moral outrage over a poor family's purchase of one of those inexpensive blow-up pools for its kids to play in. He also wrote this, and I quote, having grown up in a family that experienced its share of financial challenges and having worked with many people who are even poorer, I think I can safely say that even the poor want products that are not simply designed to uplift them, to educate them, make them more healthy or more employable. I remember the joy when my parents came home with a treat like that. Yes, even the poor want to enjoy life a little 
and want their children to do so. It's a rare personal reflection, revealing a bit of why Greg was drawn to social entrepreneurs, how he came to discover his life's work, and why it mattered to him. Like all of us, I'm left wanting more, much more from this remarkable man, even as I remain so very grateful for his intellect, his friendship, and his fundamental humanity. To close, I think I can safely say that the products Greg brought to our field were his own hugely uplifting ideas, insights that vaunted the case for social entrepreneurship from the wings to center stage. But Greg was no policy wonk and shunned the bully pulpit. Instead, he chose to believe we're capable of creating more innovative societies that were up to the task of shifting a social status quo that leaves too many behind. And just as surely, he knew that this pursuit, serious stuff, and not for the faint of heart, would also bring us joy. If you're watching us on live stream, Sally, Sally thank you so much. Um, it's with great pleasure now that I'm uh, going to introduce someone else to give a few uh, personal words um, about his relationship with Greg. Um, many of you may know David Bornstein. He's a journalist and author who has concentrated his career on social innovation. Um, David, I don't think you know this, but um, your words are the first words that I ask, have asked my students to read for the past 14 years uh, of teaching social entrepreneurship. They always start out with David's price of a dream uh, and learn about selling bangles and bracelets uh, in Bangladesh. Um, and David, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, is the author of many books, including How to Change the World. Um, he's founded uh, uh, organizations like Dowser, and he is the co-author of the Fixes column in the New York Times, which concentrates on solutions rather than problems. Um, and he's brought that perspective to the field for a very long time. So please join me in welcoming David. Hmm. What a magnificent tribute, those, the kids' uh, quotes and the, the stories from the students. I'm thinking of something that Cheryl Dahl said just before we came here at the hotel. She was saying, I was, uh, we were talking about Greg, and she said, remember, longevity is not the goal. <laughs> and it's so true. I mean, what a, what a powerful, um, infinite existence to be living in so many people who are going out and rippling out and the people that they're speaking to who are rippling out. Um, I have a few, I want to talk a number of things about the impact that I think Greg had on the field of social entrepreneurship, but he really had, I want to begin by just talking about the impact he had on my life. It was, um, he, I came to social entrepreneurship, I had written this book about Grameen Bank, but I came to the field as a journalist, not really a, a, an expert, I was a storyteller. <laughs> and I remember the first time I met Greg, I'd written the book and he was, already established as the, the leading thinker in this field. And I was very nervous, and I thought, you know, I don't bring an academic rigor to my writing. I, I tell stories. I try to entertain people to maybe have some lessons in there. And I, I really felt I anticipated a, a sort of implicit rejection. And I had had that from a few people in, in some universities a couple of times. And I felt, you know, you're, you're a journalist. You're not really a serious thinker kind of thing. Um, and he was just so warm, and he basically sat, I remember sitting in his car one day for an hour after um, he had dropped me off somewhere, and we just talked for an hour, and he was just, he went on and on and on talking about what a gift you have, you to tell these stories and to get them out into the world and to engage people, what you're doing. And he made me feel that what I was doing was probably the most important thing that anyone could be doing. I walked away from that conversation on such a high and with so much energy, and he really did shape you know, the path that I've been on for many, many years. And, um, and then over the years, I would get phone calls and emails from people from, I probably got 30 people called me up over the years and said, oh, we're looking for a speaker, and Greg said that you're the perfect one. Or, um, you know, Greg said I should get in touch because you should speak to my social entrepreneurship class or my entrepreneurship class or something. I mean, it just profoundly generous over the years in putting me out there in the world 
And, um, and then the last time I was in this room, it was because he had, he had given me um, th this award for leadership in social entrepreneurship that um, I was very, very moved by that because I felt that as an outsider covering a field, I was sort of um, separate from the deep thinking that was taking place inside. I was very, very moved by the, um, the deep generosity and, and egolessness of Greg over the years. And in thinking about how he shaped the field of social entrepreneurship, I think that his character, as well as his thinking, is very, very important in terms of um, the, 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 the vibe of the field, I guess you could say. I mean, you know, people have written about how George Washington shaped the character of the United States and how his farewell address was such a profound, important statement about what the country was going to become. I think of Greg and his, you know, the way he thought about social entrepreneurship from the very beginning. He was always profoundly um, un in, un unmovable on the principles. It should be about dignity. It should be about changing, pe helping people change their own lives. It should be about impact. The means, he was totally agnostic about the means. Any vehicle could be used. Any model that you could think of could be used. He was willing to, to radically transform and question every single field. And when he thought about, when he talked about the field of social entrepreneurship, he really insisted that it was not anything that should be in any one school or any faculty. It wasn't in business, in finance, in policy, in the school of education. It was totally a meta, a meta profession or a meta calling. Um, and his analysis was always very open to myself, to if you wanted to be a social innovator as a communicator, there was a pathway for you and you could find it in his thinking or as a teacher or as an, a doctor or as an urban planner. And I found that very, um, it's interesting in seeing that his thinking had gone years later to the Open Solution Society because there's a total coherence in really what he was talking about from the very beginning. And what, what it really was was the agency in everyone um, and creating these, these frameworks that unlock that from the various, um, from the, the earliest moment in people's lives. Um, the thing that also really struck me about Greg is, uh, although he had a tremendous analytic ability and he had a critical, uh, a, a, an ability to, criti criti to, to critique ideas, um, he was, at essence, a, an appreciative intellect and a, and a constructive intellect. And there's a quote, and I forget, I think it's from Goethe, which, and it, I'm paraphrasing it, but it goes something to the effect of the man of analytic or critical intellect finds something ridiculous in everything. The man of constructive or synthetic intellect finds something useful in everything. And Greg had that. He found useful ideas in every field. And if you read any of his papers, you see that he is pulling together ideas from many, many fields, and he's crediting everyone because he was always sharing the credit. I think that one of the reasons why he wasn't as prolific a writer as other people is because he was so modest. And he, I think to him it may be, um, it may have been um, just like he may have caused this storm to keep so many people away. Um, it may have been a, a, a sign of immodesty to sort of put himself forward and his name on a book when in fact, what, do, what, do books, what are books, they're collections of research from 20 other people that you've put together. I think he really was this, um, this person who saw wisdom everywhere and saw useful ideas all around him. And he was very, very generous with his ideas once I asked him a question about a book that I was trying to write, and he, um, you know, he just, he, he spent an hour on the phone just listening to me talk about this idea and asking me question after question after question after question to try to help me clarify my ideas. Just like that, it was just, and the other thing is he used his stature to help other people become bigger in the world. He had this, this position, but he was very quiet and gentle about it, but he, put other people forward in all sorts of situations, including me, in many places where I know that he could have, um, he could have, and he, sh he was, it would have been perfectly right for him to take a position or to move forward for himself. He very often let other people take those positions and have the, the speeches or join the committees or whatever it was. Um, I think at essence, the thing that defines his his thinking about the field is that he was, um, he had a, a very deep sense that um, 
he was that it needed to be unwavering on this core, that it was about impact of a particular type. And it was particularly about the impact of helping people um, to achieve dignity in their lives. This was, I think, something that was profoundly important to him. I remember when he was working on his book about charity. <clears throat> we talked many times about that book. Um, I think he, he didn't follow through with it because it was ultimately too much of a critical book, and that wasn't his strength. But the thing that, that really, really bothered him about this idea of charity was ultimately <clears throat> it, had the, it posited that there were people in need and people who had capacity, and he just didn't see the world. He didn't see any benefit in separating the world in, along those lines. I think his idea was that everybody had capacity and that it was our job as, as a world to make it possible for every person to make the contribution to the world that would both give them joy and would help other people in the world to make those meaningful contributions. So on, on his own terms, um, which would be uh, impact, um, I would say Greg is a, is, is a resounding success because of the way that he helped build the field of social entrepreneurship. And once again, there are different ways. Every leader has their own, their own ways of reaching people. You can write, you can be like Jane Jacobs and write this book and, and the book goes off and, and, and has this power to it. Greg's way was to build community. I think that he was, he was basically somebody who, who um, was at his best when he was with other people, talking to them, listening to them, and he was pure genius when he was helping you with your ideas. It was pure genius. I mean, I think he touched the deepest level of creativity when he was in that role, and you can see that echoed with all his students. So by actively building and nurturing relationships for many years um, and helping people one by one feel bigger, um, sharing his ideas and insights, and by showing up, and Susan Davis said this beautifully, said, she said, Greg was someone who showed up. He was at the most, he was at the forums, he showed up in the lives of his students, he showed up in the lives of his colleagues, he showed up in my life, he showed up in the way that was necessary to build this growing community of people who will continue to build these ideas. I think, um, I think that um, it's a real tribute to the, how important a teacher and a researcher and a friend can be in building a community over a 20 year period that has enough critical mass to, um, to really change the world, truly. Um, I'm, I'm thinking, in conclusion, I was thinking of like, what's a, what's a quote that sums up Greg's life? And this, this quote from, uh, you know, Greg was very much about uh, insisting on being effective. He felt that, you know, the key is, it, it doesn't matter how much you care, it doesn't matter what your intention is. True caring is being effective. That is how he saw it. It's if, you, if you really, really cared, you went through iteration after iteration after iteration to get it right. That was what caring was. And when I think about it, it didn't come, that was not really cut from his intellect, that was really from his heart. And it reminded me of the quote from Tolstoy, where, where Tolstoy, the great Tolstoy said um, at, towards the end of his life, everything I know, I know only because I love. And that really sums up Greg. We're now joined by Tom Tierney. Thank you, Tom, for You're joining welcome. us. Tom is, for those of you who may not know, I doubt, doubt there are many, is the co-founder of the Bridge Band Group. He co-founded it in 1999 and stepped down from his position um, as the chief of uh, Bain to uh, collaborate uh, with uh, mission-driven leaders and organizations to accelerate social impact. Um, and what we thought we would do now, and we're going to do this um, to a little bit of a lesser degree, uh, I think, than we had planned. We had um, another panelist um, or two who would hope to be here tonight, but because of whether or not. Um, so just the three of us, I think we're going to talk a little bit. Um, uh, I have a little bit of a conversation about some of the, the major themes in Greg's work, um, looking back to see where some of the ideas um, kind of came from and how they have evolved in the field, um, and then also looking forward. But then we also want to open up the room um, so we have so many amazing people here today, um, and we'd love to get your reflections. 
um, on the uh, ways to explore uh, Greg's influence um, through his through his ideas um, and through his through his person. So, um, to, to start us off, maybe Tom, I could turn to you um, to give us a few of your thoughts and reflections. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, I'm honored to be here, and I think virtually everybody in this room should be on the stage somehow. <laughs> Uh, my interactions with Greg began in 1999. And to some extent, I think uh, be, uh, it's fair to say that Greg was a founder of Bridgespan. So we launched Bridgespan in late 99. There were, there were four of us. And my co-founder, Jeff Braddock, had known Greg for many years and asked Greg to get involved because there was this peculiar notion embedded in Bridgespan, and that was that we would learn something by doing all these consulting projects and service projects that we would actually learn something. In the context of learn something, learning things, we maybe could, could help others learn. Now, that wasn't prominent in my mind when we launched Bridgespan. So we got Greg involved first as an advisor. Subsequently, he joined our board. And when I say he was a founder of Bridgespan, it was his personality and drive that kept us focused on the power of ideas and the power of engaging others around those ideas. In fact, joined, uh, Greg joined our board, was a board member from the, the, the very, very beginning. And in our board meetings and outside of those board meetings, he would push us, push us around what we were learning and how would that be useful to others? And were we sure we had it right? And what kind of work should we be doing to learn more? And he had this sort of relentless ability to nudge in a gentle, caring kind of way. My co-founder, Jeff Braddock, unfortunately isn't here this week. He's not here today. And one of the reasons is Greg. Because Greg was so intent on learning, we scoured the world and said, where are there programs and ideas, especially focused on poverty, that we could learn from? Well, it turned out that's India. <laughs> so Bridgespan's now opening up some services and doing some things in India, not to provide services, to learn. To learn. Greg was relentless in helping us pursue learning. He ended up chairing our external advisory committee around knowledge, again, pushing us. And personally, I'd have to say three things about Greg. First of all, he was a steady hand. I remember uh, being scared. I remember being scared leaving Bain and Company. We had 2,200 people at that time, and I joined a charity with four people <laughs> in a cubicle. What's going on here? And Greg was this calming influence. It's going to be OK. And as Bridgespan scaled over the years, you know, we're bumping into one challenge after another. It's going to be OK. He'd ask questions that helped me figure out actually it was going to be OK. The, his ability to have a steady hand was extraordinary. And the second thing was his leadership. You know, the world tosses the word leader around as if it has to be accompanied by a business card in the top of a pyramid. Jim Collins, in his work on leadership, defines, quote, level five leadership as having humility and fierce resolve. Humility and fierce resolve. Now, doesn't that just characterize Greg? Fierce resolve around those principles that you talked about. Doing the right thing to help others. Doing the right thing to generate impact. And humility, it was never about him. And he exerted this leadership in amazing ways. He certainly did at Bridgespan. And not just Bridgespan, the organization, Bridgespan, the network of folks that have been involved. And the third thing, of course, is he was the consummate teacher. He was always teaching. And I didn't know this early on about him. He was sneaky. <laughs> so you'd be sitting there talking as if you, know, you had all these answers, and he'd just be listening. <laughs> And then you'd pause to catch your breath because you have to breathe. And he would say, you know, do you mind if I ask you a question or two? Or sometimes he'd say, you know, I might have an example that would be relevant here. And I learned that when he said that, you were, the, the response was to get out your pen very quickly <laughs> and start listening. 
because that was his way of opening the dialogue in a very gentle way, saying, you know, you may not know everything you think you know. <laughs> so let's do a little exploration here. So Greg was the consummate teacher. He was the consummate entrepreneur in so many ways, and the consummate leader, and the consummate friend. Thank you. Um, as David um, remarked yesterday as we were planning for this talk, um, the themes of Greg's work um, actually progress very logically, which I admit I had not thought about uh, in quite as the, the clear way that you had, David, um, in thinking about social entrepreneurship first as a as an organizing principle um, for people uh, and for organizations, and then thinking about, well, what are those organizations? What can they become? How can they actually scale their impact? And what are the misconceptions that we have about that? And, and how do we, you know, and he, and he dug into that. Then he did some work with Paul Bloom around thinking about organizations, you know, within an ecosystem, within a, you know, a constellation of, of influences and in organizations. And what can, we, what can we learn from thinking about how those things interact? And then his latest um, thinking really about society as a whole. I was wondering, David, if you wanted to, to um, kind of take us back to um, the beginning of that, I mean, comment on that, but also take us back to the beginning of this idea of, of social entrepreneurship as a boundary, you know, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an overarching term that, that you know, when, when does it help people to think of themselves as uh, falling under, underneath this kind of generic term, as opposed to I'm a <laughs> You know, I'm a poverty alleviator, and I'm an educator. No, I'm a social entrepreneur, and kind of where it's come um, in the years since, in terms mm. of where that boundary helps us or where it may limit us. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. Um, I think I think for Greg, it, the it was very much about sort of the usefulness of a frame. Like you can, you know, what's the difference between a humanitarian and a social entrepreneur? Well. Presumably, you can study a social entrepreneur. You have to just kind of like love or admire a humanitarian. And so there's something you can really do with, once you put, bring this frame around it. There's 100 years or more, 200 years of history and sector building around what is entrepreneurship is not necessarily a person. It's a, it's a, it's a behavior pattern. Um, it's sorts of things like that. So I think that, that that frame and the usefulness of that frame was ultimately the um, sort of the key distinction for him. I remember just recently one of my colleagues um, who was writing a fixes column inter interviewed Greg. I guess it was, maybe, I don't know how many months ago it was. Um, and she was trying to get this idea like around the, what, what is a social enterprise. And she was, I could tell she was confused about it. And then she showed me the, the notes that she took from the interview. I said, speak to Greg. He'll set you up. And so she said, he said this thing. And um, it was, he said to her, he said, if a man opens a bakery and uses the profits from that bakery to buy a sailboat, is he running a sailing company? <laughs> right? And that was how he was able to show her that just because you spin something off into something else doesn't mean that that's the core thing. The core thing is what it is. And he was able to take this frame similarly with the frame of social entrepreneurship and boil it down to these core elements that allow you to know what's the difference and what's the power in understanding whether or not, um, in understanding these ideas of what it is, for example, um, to um, have the seeds of scale built into an idea from the beginning versus to not have economies of scale from, from the set. Having that idea or even that frame is very, very powerful from the outset. I see it all the time with young people interviewing them how just not having that distinction, it, once you have that distinction, the level of your problem solving is much, much higher. And it was really, I think it was for Greg, it was, will it help people at every single level be better problem solvers? Um, in terms of these, the d idea of scaling, right, which is one of these kind of, has become one of these very core concepts uh, in the field. Um, and maybe ask you, Tom. You know, more than more than um, anyone, Greg worked so hard to help us not conflate growth with scaling impact. Um, and I still feel as if we we fall into that uh, 
trap of thinking that things, you know, that how, how, do you, how do you understand the difference between these two? How has that come through in your work in Bridgespan? Um, and, how, and talk to us a little bit about the, the pit, pitfalls of, of sure. that kind of thinking. Well, th this issue of, of scaling is of profound importance. And I suspect, you know, years from now, when people are writing the, the detailed history of the social sector, that in addition to social entrepreneurship, this, this concept is going to be one of the gems that, that will have Greg's name attached. You know, with a business background, you think about the purpose of business is to scale profits. And you can see the profits need to be yours. <laughs> You're not scaling somebody else's profits. And so we launched Bridgespan. I had this mindset, of course, you're growing the organization and you, you, know, you do stuff and the stuff accrues to you somehow. Now, it's a social organization. We're trying to have impact in the world through knowledge and stuff. But there's this, this profit analog that you kind of can't, if you have a business background, it's, it's, hard to, it, 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 it's, it's hard to forget that. Greg broke that. He said, it's, in essence, it's not about profit to you, it's about profit to the world. And if you can enable things to happen that wouldn't happen otherwise, that are good for society, that's value added. And the, the gem of that is scaling impact, not just scaling the organization. And that is massively liberating. It is massively liberating because you, you say, aha, if other things are happening where the value accrues to others, but those things are useful to society, they're getting impact, then that's kind of that's good. And it's better than kind of good. If you can figure out models that scale impact beyond your organization, that's leverage plus. And I think that idea is a powerful idea. It does not yet have the traction that it will have because more and more organizations, I mean, Kaboom is an illustration we saw up there, are saying to themselves, we can't solve social problems by one unit at a time. <clears throat> I'm on the board of the Nature Conservancy using a conservation analog. We can't solve the world's conservation challenges by bucks and acres. We can't protect, protect enough acres. It doesn't work that way. You have to figure out other ways to do it. So scaling impact means ecosystem services. It means other kinds of issues. It means legislation. It means things that will address problems that are not just protecting acres. And I think the social sector has a kind of bucks and acre, had, sometimes have a bucks and acre mentality. It's how many children we serve in that after school program, not how many lives are changed as a consequence of our activities. So it's more complicated, but I think it's what's happening now is the demand, the, the demand on behalf of organizations, and we're seeing this to scale their impact, not just scale their volume, mm -hmm. is escalating dramatically. Because it is the only way we will solve big problems. I mean, the, yeah. the, in Greg's paper, The Meaning of Social Entrepreneurship, you can see the seeds of this right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And probably the most interesting thing that he said, and the thing that actually struck with me the most when I first read that, was he had these five criteria, as I, as I recall, of what constituted social entrepreneurship. But the one was most interesting to me was leveraging resources that you don't control. Okay, and I remember reading that and I was like, what does he mean? Now, I think about it, I think that and through many conversations, I think that about that all the time now. I mean, with, with my own organization, the Solutions Journalism Network, the question that we have all the time is, how can we get, you know, 100 newsrooms to practice social entrepreneurship without spending any money, <laughs> right? Well, there's a, it's an interesting challenge. We may not be able to do it. How can we do it with spending the least possible amount of money? And that question has been baked into my thinking for many, many years because of Greg's, um, you know, Greg's bringing that up right at the beginning of his interest in this field. And then if you take it all the way to the Open Solutions Society, leveraging resources you don't control, everybody in the society becomes a problem solver. And, everybody, and the best of those problems, the best of those solutions get more attention, i.e. journalism is good for that. They get more policy support, they get more academic research, they grow, they iterate further. And you can see how that's, that the scale is baked into that deep insight that he had right from the beginning. Which bloomed over a 20 year period, right? I mean, part of this is seeing how he planted, I feel like he came up with these frameworks that seem deceptively simple, right? Kind of. And then, and then we all played with them, 
right, and tried to apply them in our organization. Well, it works for this, it doesn't work for this, and then kind of you know take on. And then we have new institutions now whose job it is to think about. And then you things. have all the how tos behind that. How yeah. do you do that? How do you finance that? How do you recruit for that? How do you? There's a whole set of constellation of how to questions behind that, but that's the goal. The goal is to make everybody as powerful in in a constructive way, so that they, so that we can all add our gifts to the world in the way that will align with what the world needs, what we love the most, and what the historic opportunity is. Mm -hmm. So I want to connect a couple of dots because I think this is really important part of Greg's legacy and actually important part of the of the future, and that is more and more today we all realize we can't solve problems alone. And if you think about what's happened in the last even five years, you know, whether it's collective impact or whether it's public-private partnerships or local initiatives combining philanthropists and social sector leaders and school districts, you know, the amount of cross-boundary mm -hmm. effort that's going on, it's everywhere, right? It's gaining share. The essence of that is exactly what you just said, David. It's not just doing it. It's enabling good things to happen that would not otherwise have happened. It's that enabling mechanism and that collaborative mechanism and that innovative mechanism. And you can trace that directly back to what Greg wrote about. It's extraordinary. And I think those seeds, you know, there's a time for everything, right? And I think. What's happening now is we have problems as a society that cannot be solved without, collaborative, without collaboration and with, uh, without a sense of enabling other people and other organizations to succeed in serving the world. And he saw that. It's extraordinary. So I think I'd like to open it up. We have. Um... We have two roving microphones, and I'd like to see if anyone would like to either share reflections on the impact of Greg's work or ask questions about the themes that we've been discussing. But I know there's a lot of amazing people in this room with wonderful contributions. So would anybody like to? Suzanne? So like many of you, there are so many other conversations I would have loved to have had with Greg. So I pose a question to you I would have loved to have asked him. Do you uh -oh. think there is a role for not just social entrepreneurship, but social intrapreneurship? So people doing things within organization and making powerful change. What do you think he would have said, and what do you think about that concept? Uh, I, I don't think he would have said this, but I think he was a social entrepreneur. Uh, in working within academic institutions um, and conveying his ideas and, and finding uh, ways to institutionalize you know, social entrepreneurship as a field. Um, I think uh, uh, he would have totally shirked away from that term himself. Um, but I think the, this, this notion of um, the impulse to have impact for Greg was completely divorced from the notion of a strict organizational boundary. Doesn't matter, you know. As you said, the, the the means are agnostic, right? It doesn't matter if it's a nonprofit, a for-profit, a big company, a government agency. It doesn't matter. And the and the the you know the the thing that we think about, which is very related to what Tom just said, is this: the 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 the, the culmination of these ideas today are putting real um, you know really high requirements on the kinds of skills and cross-sector collaboration uh, that, that, that people need to be prepared to kind of function in this, in this new um, impact world. And, and you know, we think a lot about that as we think about what are the skills and experiences that we want to bring our students. Um, in the early days, it was how do we kind of apply business to nonprofits, and that is absolutely not what it is anymore. Um, it is how do you take this, this new way of thinking, um, you know, thinking about outcomes, thinking about policy and levers so that you can get things done without paying for them, um, and, and thinking about you know, all of the, the great um, engines that business allows us to, to kind of capture. And I think he would, I think he would you know, be completely supportive um, of entrepreneurship as another expression of that. What do you guys think? Oh, hands down. He, you know, he would say, it's innovation that works. <laughs> it's innovation that works. And it, you know, the notion that all innovation comes from founders of organizations is a little bit off. It's, some does, 
But the, the greatest innovations come from inside companies and inside organizations and inside networks. So I, he was very liberating on that. And that's actually quite empowering, right? And, and if you said, what is a, an imperative for organizations uh, the 21st century, it's to continue to innovate and, and change. And you, that, you do that through those agents of change inside those organizations. And if you do not do that, you're on track to obsolescence. Don't you, you would agree on his view on this? I think so, yeah. <laughs> Good. Others? No other thoughts? People are collecting them. Um, we have a question. Is there one over here? Great. Who's next? <laughs> I feel very honored to be here and to witness uh, the eulogies to Greg Dees. And I didn't know him personally. I joined the Stanford Social Innovation Organization because I, because my heart knows that that's the right thing, and yet I live in Durham, and I'm a graduate of Fuqua. And someone here had to tell me he'd moved here. <laughs> so um, then I joined CASE, and uh, as, as uh, life has taken its path, my daughter majored in economics at Stanford, and I was appalled at her graduation to hear the, the trumpeting of um, the increase in the disparity of the 1% as a good thing, and, um, and the game theory tit for tat uh, praised and reinforced to all of the graduates and those sitting there. And afterwards, I shared this concern with my daughter, how sad such a thing, and she said, Mom, that's what works, do the research. So then I went and I started doing the research and I came across all kinds of models and all kinds of work that are being done now in many fields that show that that is not the model that works. And one of the things I came across, which is just resonates exactly with what Greg, what you all have highlighted as his legacy, is that impact and the added value, not necessarily just accruing to yourself, but wherever the added value shows itself, you have made it that you, that's the right thing to have done. And where I found this most beautifully was expressed in Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations. And then it occurred to me that that's why we're so wealthy now, because we did that for about 300 years. And only recently did we start thinking that we were investing in order to get money. Up until now, our, our whole Western development has been about investing for value. And we always thought we were doing it for our own profit, but Adam Smith wrote very carefully that unless you are adding value, you're gonna kind of go into a negative spiral. And I think that that's what Greg is now bringing up again, and has done such an effective job of bringing so many people and developing a language together with so many people, and I'm very thankful to be here. Thank you. It's, it's, can I speak to that? Absolutely. <clears throat> I think that your, the, the issue that you raise, and especially you know, the experience of um, you know, going through college, and you graduate four years later, and your head is not full, full of solutions and an incredibly you know, animating passion to solve a bunch of problems, because you just see it's just intoxicating. I remember when I had completed the research for my book, How to Change the World, and I had interviewed more than 100 people around the world. I remember having a, just drinking a caipirinha in Brazil with Peter Lenny, my translator, and saying, why don't they tell people about this? 
this is amazing. There's so many. And you know, and I had just learned about the Ashoka Fellowship. Ashoka gave Greg their first um, Lifetime Achievement Award when they created that because there were all of these people, all of these orchids and cracks in the pavement popping up all around the world, solving social problems, thinking about scale and impact and leverage, recruiting, mass recruiting other people, thinking how do we refinance social change, all this stuff. This extraordinary landscape shift is occurring at the end of the 20th century, and the universities are oblivious to it. And kids are graduating not without, without 100 ideas of what they could be doing with this 80 years that they have in this three-dimensional space. And Greg basically saw that and said, we need to inject this into the academy. And he created the legitimizing pass. He, said, you know, he brought it to a couple of Ivy League and elitist, you know, four elite uh, institutions, legitimized an academic path that has rippled off. And because of that, you now have, I don't know how many young people who are regularly exposed to this idea that on the menu of options in life is this idea that you can be um, this incredibly wonderful subversive kind of person going out there in the world and changing things. And that should be available to everybody. And it, you, it should be illegitimate and illegal to graduate from a university without having been introduced to this life option. And, and Greg has been played, probably played the most important role in the world to make that part of the academic experience. So it's. And, and I have to echo, yeah, there's, a, there's a profound byproduct. Sure, not really illegal, by the way. A, a, there's a profound byproduct feel illegal. to that, which, which, which is, do we not have an opportunity, all of us, to be of service to the world? Whether we're doing it full time out of college as a social entrepreneur, or whether we're doing it two hours a week as a mentor to a poor child, or whether we're doing it you know, starting at age 70 as a full time you know, chairman of a board or something, who knows, but do we all not have that opportunity to be of service? Because I actually think the notion of social entrepreneurship, which, which started out with the youth, where change comes from, has blossomed into, you know, encore careers, right? Mark Friedman, encore careers, and who would have thunk that? And so the, the ripple effects have been extraordinary. And Greg wasn't the only one, but boy, oh boy, Greg was one of the few that I think turned the light on in a kind of dark room. Hmm. We have another one in the back. Okay. Uh, hello, I'm, my name's Jimmy Childry, and I'm from Sandersville, Georgia. Hearing everyone talking about Greg uh, motivates me to tell a personal story, and I apologize that it's personal. It's fine. But I think it is what Greg Dees meant to me. I'm a Gimba 01 graduate, I finished here uh, spring of 01 with the global class and thought I was finished with Fuqua. Uh, not meaning that in a negative way, but I completed my studies. And the month I started my work at, uh, the month I became a student here at Fuqua, I also joined a nonprofit hospital board in my hometown. My vocation is automobile dealerships. Never knew that I'd have any other interest in healthcare more than serving out my term on this board. Well, as I graduated from the board, uh, I became a reluctant chairman of the board. After I graduated from Fuqua, I'm sorry, the month afterwards, I became a very reluctant chairman of the board. And after two years of being chairman, I realized this organization has an extremely important social mission. It's a business, and it's a complicated, complex business, but there's something else more important here. So I decided to come back to Fuqua, study health sector management, and I went to the University of Cambridge simultaneously, simultaneously to do a research degree in nonprofit business. The program is called Social Entrepreneurship. The first day of class, they're putting up research and names of pioneers, and Greg D's name keeps popping up. And I see he's at Fuqua. And I think, well, I need to meet this guy at some point. So I'm assigned a paper. I'm assi I have an assignment to write a research paper on developing a strategy for our hospital. I had no idea where to start. But I knew about Greg D's at Fuqua. So I came over and started hanging around the doorway of his office a couple of times. He finally invited me in. <clears throat> we sat down. I said, I need to write a strategy paper about a nonprofit hospital, and I don't know where to start. So we had a long talk. He gave me lots of names of research and writers to look at that I'd never heard of. Fast forward. That paper became the pathway for the restructuring of our hospital 
I stepped down as chairman to become CEO to lead that restructuring. The first day of work as CEO, and I never worked in healthcare in my life until the day I became CEO of this hospital. I uh, thought, well, I've got to start somewhere. So I gave the managers my definition of a, of a manager. And I said, a manager's role is to leverage the resources available to the firm in order to achieve the highest possible outcomes while mitigating risk to the stakeholders. And I thought that was a tall order, but we started it. And we have changed the whole model of how to look at a nonprofit hospital. <laughs> and that is because I met Greg Dees. <laughs> this has a lot to do with Fuqua, and I see some other professors here. It had a lot to do with a lot of people here, but Greg Dees is the one that pointed me down the right path, changed my career, my vocation. I have this encore <laughs> vocation now, this encore career. And I just, I'll never be able to thank Greg Dees and Case and Fuqua enough for it. Thank you so much, James. I appreciate it. Wow. There's another one over here and over there, too. I'm Carol Lamb from the Mountain Association for Community Economic Development in Berea, Kentucky, which is, I guess, the place that was referenced in that final quote there about Greg saying he was in Appalachia for a while and found it hard or whatever. <laughs> um, and um, I was, I'm one of, I think, three people that are still with Mason who were there when Greg was there. Um, and talk about ripples. I'm getting a sense of ripples today that um, I really didn't know um, until I sat here and listened to these stories. Um, my recollection of Greg is that he was a very kind and thoughtful and intellectual person and um, that there were some uh, loud and, ch well, not loud on Greg's part, but loud on some other people's part, maybe um, conversations, uh, disagreements about things um, as Greg would push questions and make observations um, and challenge us about our work. Um, and that I, I have very warm memories or warm feelings toward him, but I really had not followed his career beyond knowing that, you know, he then went to Stanford and then he went to Duke and that was about all I knew. Um, and, but as I sit here today and hear all these, the things that we think about all the time are the things that you're talking about, Greg thinking about, about scaling and, um, you know, how do you really find impact and using, doesn't matter what kind of tools you use and all that kind of stuff. I, I just really wonder now how much of that, um, came to us or got stimulated because of the time that Greg spent with us. Thank you. <laughs> there was... I have a brother who went to <clears throat> Harvard Business School, and uh, between his two years, he went to Bangladesh. And I was like, what? <laughs> Bangladesh? And um, he went to work with BRAC, and the reason he went to work with BRAC was that he had Greg as a, as a professor, and Greg, he helped Greg write a case about BRAC, and um, I thought, wow, this is a this pretty interesting guy who could make my brother um, do something as, as wonderful and interesting as that, and develop all kinds of parasites, and learn all about silkworms, and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> so it was just, uh, it was, wow, that's amazing. And then I learned that he went where I had gone to business school, to Yale, and, um, when I began teaching about financing social entrepreneurship, and I have the, the joy of doing that with Kathy here at Fuqua, um, you know, he's everywhere. And he was always, I always started out my class with, you know, what is a social entrepreneur? Well, there was Greg's definition, and it was by far the most useful and helpful of all of them. So, but I, I think what I wanted to, um, to bring up was uh, his honesty, because um, that's what, struck me over and over again about him, and I think it, it goes to why he understands the need for organizations to collaborate, because he's honest about their limitations, right? But um, I think he was really honest about, and it's interesting what you said, Carol, really honest about how it just didn't work out for him at Mesa, you know, that you'd, you won't find very many people who will say, yeah, it, you know, I just wasn't very good at it, and it just didn't work out, and 
didn't hide that, you know, and um, I just thought, wow, that's really cool. And then um, when he first started getting sick, I remember sitting in his office with him and him sharing um, just a you know, just as if I, he had known me for years and years and years, um, what was going on in his life and how he was feeling and his disappointments and and um, he just was very unusual in in that way. I think that he could um, reach people and share with them in an honest way um, what he was thinking about and what he was feeling as a as a person and as a as an ac academician and. Um, just as someone in the world is trying to do the best work that he can and, and have impact. So um, that, just that threat of, of honesty and, and helping people reach their, you know, their, be their best self um, is what I'll remember from him. Thanks, Rick. <laughs> Was there another hand? I thought I saw, yes. Hi, I'm the second year here at Jack Fuqua, Alexia Park. Um, so we talk about a collect, the importance of collective imp impact to foster, to promote the ecosystem of social entrepreneurship. And then I think that one of the important player in that collective impact is the business schools like Fuqua. So I'm kind of curious what is kind of changing role of business uh, schools to kind of foster the future leaders in social entrepreneurship for you or anyone here. Could you say that again? I'm sorry, I missed the last Oh, one. yeah, the role of business schools uh, to foster um, kind of new generation of leaders in the social entrepreneurship. Do you guys want to speak to that? Well, I'm happy to. I think to... she knows what I think, so I think we're going to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, um, it was about 20 years ago when Harvard Business School, with funding from a gentleman named John Whitehead, uh, began the initiative for social enterprise, social enterprise initiative. The, that was a, a breakthrough. It was the first uh, business school in the country, I think, to really take a big step forward. Uh, their first faculty person was Greg. And interestingly, it was social enterprise. It didn't, it wasn't the nonprofit sector. Going way back then. And that initiative has continued to blossom. And then that same little bumblebee <laughs> went to Stanford. <laughs> and now we have the Stanford Social Innovation Review and huge effort around poverty reduction and so forth at Stanford. And then over here, and if you traced business education over the last 20 years, you would see that 20 years ago, it was hard to find uh, cases on anything that looked like a social entrepreneur or a nonprofit organization or, or anything. And now, I think we'd be hard pressed to find a major business school in the country that does not teach, at least at some level, these, these ideas. And at HBS, and I think this is true here, and other fine schools, the job is to educate leaders to make a difference in the world. It, it's not to educate just profit people. It's educate leaders who make a difference in the world. And I think you see that here throughout. I think we see it other places as well. And so I would say, if you believe, as Greg would, that it's all about talent, it's all about people, and you think about the way the flows of talent have evolved over 20 years from business schools into not just businesses, but now social enterprises of all kinds and shapes, or even the role of businesses in society is changing, right? That it's had a profound, it's had a profound impact on the way people think and the way people act after they graduate. David, any I, thoughts? Yeah, I, uh, you know, I, I went to business school before I was a journalist at McGill University in Canada. And it it's, surprises me how often the frameworks that I got when I was, I was, was an undergrad, it was a Bachelor of Commerce, but the frameworks that I got there stuck with me throughout my career. And when I'm interviewing people and looking at things, I think that there are these core frameworks and strategic insights 
Um, and you know, it, it comes from generations of sector building that have been around for, for hundreds of years that are just useful across the board. They're not useful to build businesses. They're useful to pro solve problems in any field. They're useful for urban planners. They're useful for nurses, for priests who want to go out and do things um, and create an institution to spread their ideas. I, and I think that there are these core frameworks that should be widely distributed, um, and I think they should be available to children as well. You know, understandings, financial understandings, should begin very early in life. Um, so I, I see, I think that basically what we call business school should, it, it would be wonderful if that were a feeder into sort of the, the um, problem solving capacity of the entire society, if somehow business schools pushed in that way. Um, I'm, I'm struck by how, uh, I'm often looking at institutions that get better as they grow and institutions that sort of become more and more approximations of their original goodness as they grow. And it's interesting how, how you grow and, and improve. And I think that probably more than any other sector of the field of business understands that, that sort of um, fractal idea of getting larger but still maintaining the sort of integrity as you do that. So I think that that's also a key insight that other se sectors could really draw from. So I'm going to take this opportunity to actually um, <clears throat> switch us in a different direction for a few minutes. Um, as some people have alluded to, um, Greg was in the process of writing a manuscript about the Open Solution Society. Um, and inside it, uh, we have pieces of it, and we're trying to work to see whether we can put them together and share them more broadly. Um, but inside it, he really um, has some very strong criticisms and provocations for the field. And I wanted to actually read some excerpts um, so that we can... Nothing personal, right? Nothing personal. <laughs> let, them, let them sink in and, and see what we think. Um, so again, these are just small excerpts. So uh, forgive me, Greg, for not letting everyone hear the whole thing. Um, all around the world, people are suffering needlessly. Money is being wasted. And business opportunities are being lost because we are failing to capitalize fully on the willingness of private citizens to apply their ingenuity and resources to solving social and environmental problems. In the meantime, we give social entrepreneurs awards and thank them for their wonderful service to humankind while they must struggle, often without adequate financial and managerial support, to spread their innovations, innovations that would have significant social and economic benefits if widely adopted. This is a societal failure and a systemic problem. The Open Solution Society is one that makes progress on its goals and tackles the inevitable problems associated with history's march forward by relying on a set of institutions, values, and systems that invite the participation of anyone with the ideas, energy, capabilities, resources, and drive to develop, test, assess, refine, and scale effective new approaches to solving problems. The bad news is that even though the seeds have been planted, no society operating today meets this description. We are not there yet, even in the US. The good news is that many experiments are underway to move us in this direction in countries around the world. The search for bottoms up innovations is on, but what's missing is an understanding of the institutional and cultural structures necessary for this activity to become more than a fragmented set of admirable but incomplete experiments that touch only a tiny part of the problems they were meant to solve. We have the opportunity to do so much more. Societies need dynamic capabilities that inspire innovative problem solving, encourage rigorous testing and evaluation, allow refinement and adaptation of innovations, and balance the benefit, improve performance, and cost disruption of innovation with the value and risks of continuity. They need portfolios of solutions from which to draw as their challenges change over time, and they need mechanisms for selecting from the portfolio. To do this, they need institutions that contain the possibility, which related to your last point, of their own renewal and reinvention, adaptive institutions. So panel, do we, are we, are, do we need an open solution society the way that Greg said, and are we close? Are we on the path? It's a long path. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, my, 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 my own sense, uh, I, I, and I agree fully with what Greg is saying, is that um, you, you can look at that at many, many levels. You know, you could look at that at the level of um, 
at the age of five, for example, according to what we now know about toxic stress in early childhood, a huge number of people already um, have had so many adverse experiences that it's very, very difficult for them to really be um, the people that they could have been. Okay. So you could look at where does capacity get stunted to be a, a problem solver. Uh, or you could look at it at the societal level of, you know, there's a wonderful quote by Walter Lippmann, the, 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 who wrote Public Opinion 100 years ago, where he was a journalist, where he said, um, the way the world is imagined will determine what we do. He actually said, well, the way the world is imagined will determine what men do, but I'm switching it to what we do. Um, and the idea is that we all come into the world with a sense of what's possible for our institutions, what's possible for ourselves, what pathways are available to us. You know, when I speak at colleges and I give the students, I say, you have 90 seconds, write down as many global problems as you can think of. <laughs> and then I say, okay, you have 90 seconds, write down as many of the emerging solutions as you can think of. You have on the left side of the blackboard 150 things written down. There's no more room. And on the right side, there's like four things. And this is the mental map. This is the way people are imagining the world. It's very mediated. It's not a true world, but it's a world of very, and so the few people that go on and chart pathways because they have a sense of possibility have to be hunter-gatherers. They have to have found those possibilities and heard them from taxi drivers or from wonderful people and, or teachers or whoever it is. But the, the majority of people, when they think of where is the possibility to have a big impact with my life, they think of the established pathways that are already out there. You know, a traditional business person is a pathway that everybody's familiar with. There's, there's, you, everybody could name 20 successful companies. That's not hard to do. So how do we make these pathways visible to people so that they can even glimpse the possibilities? Then you get to the level of, once many, many more people are doing that, what is the whole uh, infrastructure of, uh, of sector building supports that are needed? Financial, research, changing, you know, all the whole, I mean, business built these things over three centuries. There are, you know, many, many pieces. Um, but I, I feel very, very strongly that the ability to envision these possibilities is such a big bottleneck right now because it's, it's so constrained in terms of what people really think the world is like and what people think is possible both for society and for themselves in, in, in their own pathways. Tom, what do you think the bottlenecks are? And are we working on them in the right way? I think the, my general reaction to Greg's writing is I'm slightly more optimistic, maybe substantially more optimistic than he is. And here's, here's why. Okay. Um, we go back 50, 60 years ago, we had the man in the gray flannel suit. We, where institutions really did rule. And now you fast forward and you have Facebook and you have Twitter, you have social networks, you have people accomplishing things at age 20 or 25 that you know, two generations ago they would have said, this is impossible. You have social investment bonds being experimented with. You have public-private pri partnerships occurring in ways they hadn't before. So you have technology enabling information and connections in a manner that you couldn't have imagined you know, 60, 80 months ago, you couldn't have imagined. So where I say I'm optimistic, I think Greg points at an issue that is a profound issue. The question is, are the seeds already planted mm -hmm. that to some extent are going to begin to address that issue? And maybe it's the optimist in me, but I, it feels to me like some of those seeds are planted. They're being technology enabled. Because what do we know? We know by and large, good things happen when they're driven by obsessed people who want to achieve results. And those obsessed people need to be connected to other obsessed people. They need to be connected with resources. They need to have some way of knowing what's working and what isn't working. And we're learning a lot more in the world about what is and isn't working. And we're able to connect in ways we couldn't possibly have connected uh, before. Resources aren't flowing. So I'm not actually sure that the answer lies in institutions in the traditional sense that maybe you would interpret that word. I, I kind of think it might lay more around collaborations and networks. 
of people who are able to mobilize resources to solve, to solve problems. But I look at the way the world is now, and I say, hmm, it could be. And when I read Greg's work, I had the same thought. I went back and read the, you know, his early work on social entrepreneurship when the, the phrase didn't exist. And what's happened in the ensuing 20 years. And I have to say, I thought, hmm, hmm, I wonder if. I wonder if his, he's peeking over the horizon and seeing something that, that is going to evolve because the conditions are changing that will permit it to evolve in a way that has never occurred before. And that just like with social entrepreneurship, he's sort of ringing the bell. He's ringing the bell, the first one ringing the bell. And so that was, that's my reaction. I actually think he's ringing the bell. And it not because of him, but because of what he sees and what he wrote about, some of these things are going to happen. So I, I, I'm more optimistic than maybe his language would pick up on. That's all right. That's part of being provocative is, is, <laughs> is, is getting people to, I mean, part of it is, do you really believe that it's happening or do you need people to state that it's happening? Can Absolutely. I, and that, sure. that is, helps in and of itself. Yes, Dave. I want to add one cautionary note to it because I think it's, it's really important what he's saying. I, I think if this is my big unprovable and probably wrong statement, but when historians look back on our time in history and they sort of say, what's the biggest change happening in the world today? The single biggest change. It's most transformative and destabilizing. I would say it's sort of the spread of agency, the decentralization of human capacity. The percentage mm -hmm. and the absolute number of people on the world at this point in time who languish in incapacity and isolation has plummeted. More people in individu individuals and in small groups are much more powerful than we've ever seen before. That's more powerful in the starting an organization and changing your society way, and it's more powerful in being really destructive way too, and being extreme, like we've seen with terrorism and things like that. So the question of whether or not this spread of human agency that we've seen that's been unleashed because of longer lifespans and the flow of information and the flow of capital and more people getting higher education and all of the things that have, and the woman's revolution, and everything that has added to the capacity of more and more people around the world, you're gonna have much more unleashed in, in all sorts of directions. If Greg's right and we don't do a lot of work in the next 10 or 20 years to harness that for these really positive beneficial pathways, we'll see a lot more of it going the other way because people will follow the default pathways if they have to see that this can be done and that this is not only uh, doable, but it's, you know, as Sally said, this is very joyful work. This is very aligned with what we need as people to be truly fulfilled. And that, I think that's the most important message that has to get across if we're gonna harness more of that agency for, you know, what, what needs to happen. Oh, I love that message. Thank you for that. Um, to close, I'm actually going to open a package that we got this afternoon from the White House and read you the letter. It says, I send solemn greetings to the Duke University community and all those mourning the loss of Dr. J. Gregory Dees. An inspired innovator and pioneering thought leader, Greg helped define the field of social entrepreneurship and demonstrated its potential to tackle critical challenges of our times. He made tremendous contributions throughout academia and philanthropy, business, and government. In the years ahead, his legacy will carry on in the communities he enriched and be fortified by those he taught and empowered to build a better world. I know this celebrated professor, mentor, and friend will be sorely missed, and I wish you all the best as you reflect on Greg's life and pay tribute to his extraordinary example. Signed, Barack Obama. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to our speakers for those uh, wonderful words and for all the participation from the audience tonight. I have one last logistical note and then just a, a quick closing comment. 
Um, the logistical note I mentioned earlier that there will be buses shuttling from here at Fuqua starting in two minutes at six o'clock over to the Divinity School. So if you'll be joining us for the reception and memorial service later this evening, please take advantage of those shuttles. As you leave the auditorium, you'll make a left and head straight outside. The buses will be waiting for you there. They'll loop consistently from now until nine o'clock, so it can take you back and forth to Fuqua if your car is parked here. And for a final closing comment, um, each year, CASE gives out a very special award called the CASE Leadership in Social Entrepreneurship Award. This is given to an individual who has made significant contributions to the field of social entrepreneurship. Past recipients have, include, have included the Grameen Banks, Mohamed Yunus, Acumen Funds, Jacqueline Novogratz, Ashoka's, Bill Drayton, Teach for America's Wendy Kopp, and our speaker from tonight, David Bornstein. It's, it's quite a, a wonderful group of, of leadership award winners. And we could think of no one that embodies this award more deeply than Greg Dees. He has always been the guiding light for Case, and in his honor, we are awarding the Case Leadership in Social Entrepreneurship Award to him. He was in our lives for too short a time, but we are truly grateful to have known his kind soul, generous heart, and brilliant mind. We'll display this award in the case suite to remind us of Greg's impact and our promise to him, our promise to travel in the path that he has laid out for us, a path towards a better world, acting boldly, and using innovative approaches to address social challenges. With that, we have a short photo slideshow of Greg to show. Once that is over, our program here at Fuqua is concluded, and we ask that those of you joining us at the reception and memorial service make your way to the buses to join us at the Divinity School. Thank you so much for being here tonight. <laughs>